They said it couldn't be done, but they did it anyway. They released a remaster of the first three Tomb Raider games. It exists. It's real. You have no excuse. Go play three of the greatest games of all time. Okay, fine. I may be a little biased, what with all those other Tomb Raider videos I've released on this channel, but because of that I do believe I am legally obligated to make a video about the remasters. However, there is nothing more boring to me than a graphical comparison of going, oh, look at all these extra polygons. So that is not what this video is about. Instead, it's about something that the remasters allowed me to do that I was unable to do before. You see, I have played most of the Tomb Raider series. All of the mainline games, the two co-op Lara Croft games, and even the good mobile game. But do you know what I haven't played? No, I'm not talking about the Game Boy games. I'm talking about the original expansions. You see, all three of the original trilogy of games had expansion packs. Tomb Raider had Unfinished Business, Tomb Raider 2 had The Golden Mask, and Tomb Raider 3 had The Lost Artifact. These presented a pack of new levels made using the controls and engine of the game they were attached to, which is really cool if you played the games on PC. I did not. I played them on the original PlayStation, which means I missed out on all those expansions. As an adult, I never got around to playing them either because... By this point, the hassle of trying to figure out where to get them, how to get them to work on a modern PC, plus I'd have to buy the Steam versions, reconfigure all the controls, and honestly, I had enough hassle doing the Angel of Darkness fan patches. I don't really feel like doing all that again just to play something that is an official release. And this is where the remasters come in. Initially, I had no interest in buying this collection simply because I still own the original games, they're in good condition, so I don't need to buy them again. Oh, but what's this? They come with all the expansions? Well, looks like you just convinced me. And now, 26 years on since I played the original games, I have finally played the Tomb Raider expansions without all the barriers preventing me from doing so until now. And in this video, I'm going to review each level one by one and offer my thoughts on whether it's been worth the wait. Unfinished Business is a weird beast. And I'm not just saying that because it contains a bunch of weird beasts. It contains four new levels for the original Tomb Raider, two set in Atlantis and two in Egypt. The original plan was for the two Atlantis levels to act as an extended epilogue to the game as Lara battles her way out to the boat after defeating Natla. She then journeys back to Egypt to find the city of Kamun flooded and a new temple uncovered in the process. In the original release though, these levels were flipped around. The Egypt levels came first, followed by Atlantis, requiring a retcon that stated Lara just decided to go back to the flesh pits to murder everything that was left. This made sense gameplay-wise, because the Atlantis levels were apparently brutal, and Eidos wanted players to be eased into the experience. This doesn't happen in the remaster though. The levels were flipped back to their original narrative arc, placing Atlantis in front of Egypt as God intended. So with that in mind, how does this expansion stack up to the original game? I hate this level so much. So goddamn much. What the hell is this? The Atlantean mutants were the absolute worst enemies in the entirety of the original Tomb Raider with the mummies in Egypt being a close second, although admittedly they're basically a reskinned version of the crawling mutant. Well, a version with skin, at least. Do they have skin? Whatever, let's move on. So what did the original designers of this expansion decide? Well, how about you fight an onslaught of the worst enemies in the game, en masse, relentlessly, for about an hour? Thanks, I hate it. There is barely even any puzzle design here, Levers exist simply to awaken more screeching flesh beasts. This is a level that hates the player and wants you dead. It doesn't want to entertain you or allow anything resembling fun. I hope you like lava, flesh, and screeching. You won't get anything else here. This is not a great start. Oh, more of this. Brilliant. Okay, no, to be fair, there is a ludicrous boulder trap that opens the level that is 
so over the top in its design and execution that I can't even be mad at it. The first time I saw this I laughed so hard. Sure, it's on the theme of these levels actively hating the player, but I kind of respect it in its audacity. There are 25 boulders here. Their trigger spots have seemingly been placed with maximum trolling in mind, and unlike the rest of the Atlantean levels, it did leave enough of an impression on me beyond just, oh god, it's another f***ing horse, that its presence arguably makes the level a little better in my eyes. The rest of the hive is just Atlantean Stronghold 2 Electric Boogaloo though, so absolutely atrocious. Hopefully Egypt is better? Maybe? This level opens with you seemingly inside the head of a cat, and then you swan dive into a hole and find yourself back in the city of Kamun. Okay, sure, it's a little disappointing for this area to be featured in a third level, but the fact it's flooded, plus that cool introduction, that all kind of makes up for it. We do get out of this area pretty quickly though, and into something completely new. We get a long corridor that feels like a concept for many areas from Tomb Raider 4 before heading through some caves and sandy places that feel much more like a standard Tomb Raider level. There's even an arbitrary boulder that falls on you without warning. Classic. Then there is this absolute clown car of crocodiles that seemingly exists just to provide some items. I do like the use of cat statues as a guiding path for the player. It happens a few times in these two levels and it's a really neat touch. It's less fun when you end up running into a large temple with multiple boulder traps on the same ramp, but I still appreciate it. The level then culminates in this outdoor area in the desert, which was kind of a first for the original Tomb Raider and one that's very welcome. It also ends with this trolling fake out of a mummy standing right on the exit, which vanishes when you get close. Thanks for making me paranoid, but I do respect it. More desert segments going on here, now with a quarter pyramid structure that makes no architectural sense, but hey, it looks cool anyway. This area provides more classic Tomb Raider structure, with a split that involves two challenges that come together to open a single door. A few winding corridors with panthers and greenery later, and we find ourselves in the actual Temple of the Cat, and oh wow, I did not expect this at all. This running cat texture is such a cool visual detail and the fact that the game encourages you to explore to find five keys in this space shows how much they wanted to show off how proud they are of this texture. I am digging this. This was worth the struggles of the Atlantis levels to get to. The next area is a gauntlet of puzzle rooms that culminates in a bunch of encounters with mummies. This does creep closer to the hell of the Atlantis levels, but it's somewhat bearable as it's mostly one area and there's a lot of space to get around. There is a troll moment where a mummy fails to come to life only to sneak up behind you when you start to move to the next area. This is bearable though, mostly because I did see it coming. Speaking of this area, it is a visual treat, and it keeps up the theme of the cat statues guiding the player to their next destination. The deadly pit is a bit of a surprise, but it is a reminder to not just charge into every area without thinking, so whatever. But then, the final room which contains a massive cat statue that you have to climb. It's a brilliant ending to a superb level. The steady climb upwards, culminating with Lara going into the cat's mouth and exiting by re-emerging from inside, it's a fun ending that capped off a genuinely enjoyable level. It's honestly one of the best Tomb Raider levels I've ever played. Unfinished Business is one brilliant level, one decent level, and two of the worst Tomb Raider levels I've ever played. The Egypt portion feels like a Tomb Raider adventure, while the Atlantis portion feels like I'm trying to remove my own eyeballs with a rusty spoon. While they certainly make sense to start with for narrative reasons, it is easy to see why Eidos demanded they were swapped for sanity reasons. If they were in the original order, I would recommend players just stop at Temple of the Cat, because they've seen all the good bits already, and you only have pain waiting for you after this point. This expansion is also the one that feels the most like an expansion. 99% of it is reused assets from the original game, with a fairly half-baked concept connecting it all together. It truly is a case of more levels if you liked the original game enough. Overall, Unfinished Business is kinda weak. There's one great level, but it does not make the collection feel worth it. But hey, it was the first go of this kind of thing, so maybe things improved with later expansions. 
The premise of the Golden Mask is that Lara is heading to an island in the Bering Sea, sitting between the nautical borders of Russia and the United States. A Soviet base is tucked away here as they search for a golden mask that holds great power or whatever. Basically, it's an excuse to send Lara into the cold without trousers again. So one thing that was immediately obvious when I played this level was how much it felt like Tibetan foothills. A big part of this is due to asset reuse, which isn't a problem in itself, but it does leave the level with an identity problem. It's supposed to be an island bordering Russia and Alaska, but it still feels like Tibet. Sure, there's a few hammer and sickles around, but that doesn't feel like enough. That said, this is a fun level. The little segments of a base within the mountainous setting provides a nice contrast as you move between the two. And of course we get the snowmobile back, although I don't feel it was quite used to its full potential. Use it for a couple of jumps and that's about it. There are also two snowmobile aspects that I really did not like. The first is this one guy using a machine gun snowmobile that killed me repeatedly, and the second is this trap jump that only leads to death. But what did I love about this level? Well, the third secret. It's a whole separate area triggered by a frozen lake being shattered by an avalanche. Then you swim through some tunnels and emerge in a huge ice cave that you have to shatter more. You also have these invisible Inuit warriors walking around who I was fascinated by. They're reskins of the Barkang monks from the main game, but it is a unique take that I did like. The final area was a bit lackluster as it ended up being a gauntlet of gun-toting enemies in a generic base location, but it does provide a nice bit of environmental storytelling for the next area, so I can't fault it too much. This level has big offshore rig energy. It's a modern location full of goons and most of it is just that. It even opens with you having to deal with a bunch of them. The worst of these are two flamethrower lads with unknowable trigger states, so one minute you're alive and happy, the next you're flame grilled. There is a better sense of location here though. The Stalin portraits plastered basically everywhere do help with making it feel more like Russia. Plus there is the central base location, which feels grounded and gives a sense of a bunch of dudes stranded out on the coldest islands on the planet feeling absolutely miserable. Would be nice if they didn't like to joyride around on their snowmobiles though, especially as they have less justification for hanging out here, but what can you do? Also, I was a little confused by this whole door sequence. You have to pull a lever, kill some guys, use a key card, and then use the lever again. I, I didn't really get what was going on here. However, you know how I praised the previous level for ending on some solid environmental storytelling? This level does it too. We get a good reason for why these guys are hanging out here as we find an excavation into some ruins that we have to climb down into. It's a really nice touch that leads us nicely into the next level. I approve. Even if the level overall is arguably the weakest of this expansion. There is a nice spooky opening to this level with a sneaky trap room and an abundance of rats to mess with you. And then you emerge into this room. It's infested with wolves. But then, you have this gold mask plinth. You see more of the spooky Inuit warriors hanging about, which adds a sense of paranoia. It feels like a trap, and then you pick up the mask and they're... Fine, okay. That's a relief. It's the Barkhang monks again, I guess. And they're quite happy for me to take their stuff, I guess. Alright. I like that opening the exit gate involves you delving into a spooky trap tunnel and a rat hole, which makes me wonder what led people to be thrown into this. It's really nice environmental storytelling, it's really cool. But then, we go through the gate, and we find ourselves in a molten river of gold. This is such an awesome concept, and this is where you learn the whole level is built around it. You travel upriver, avoiding falling into the shiny death juice, and you reach the source, which hides the big secret of the following level. Absolutely brilliant. It is a visual treat, and it adds so much unique spice to this expansion that we don't see in the main game. You also get to see how this interacts with the cold climate, as small pockets of cold river remain unaffected, but seem to be slowly being consumed over time. This also brings us exactly two polar bears just for funsies. Then you reach this ruined village, clearly destroyed by the molten river in an act of hubris from the people who seemingly worshipped it, or summoned it with supernatural means, who knows, but clearly something went down, and the village is eternally doomed. 
really cool. There is one major criticism though, and that is the fact that the gold nugget you need to leave this area is basically invisible in the remaster. Apart from that though, this level is rad. I have nothing else bad to say. This is a new favorite. Possibly the best of this expansion? The final main level of this expansion is in a completely new location. It's a neat shift that suggests a supernatural lost civilization and one that I genuinely love. It's very similar to the ending of Uncharted 2, which is appropriate since they're both supposed to be Shambhala. There are also some neat touches with areas made of gold, tying in nicely with the previous level. I also enjoy that Lara starts in a cage surrounded by yetis, like she's a ceremonial offering. The cage having two exits is also a nice addition, something that would be followed up in Tomb Raider 3 with its multiple level routes. I was less of a fan of this underground cage area, because the purpose of each lever wasn't always clear, so a lot of this was just pulling switches at random until the final route opened. I even replayed this to get all the secrets and it didn't get much better the second time with foreknowledge. This was generally a decent level, although it does feel half formed. The jungle and cages don't quite add up to a kingdom, as the name suggests, and it does feel a bit thrown together. Considering the previous levels did a much better job of feeling like their concepts, this feels like it may have been rushed to meet the deadline. The end boss is also disappointing because it is just the boss from Ice Palace in the main game. It, it's a poor ending to the entire expansion because Lara ends up not leaving with the mask. She just kills the boss and then it ends. I would have preferred a climb sequence to get back out or something. So I said I played the expansion a second time to get all the secrets, and this is why. My first run was a way of reacting to levels without spoilers, but I knew that there was a fifth level, so I needed to play through and get all those secrets eventually. Nightmare in Vegas is a conceptual mess, quite frankly. It is a bunch of assets thrown together with some of the gaudiest textures I have ever seen in a Tomb Raider game. Its structure is mostly just finding a way to fight a series of bosses, and then it just sort of ends. And yet... I kind of love it. The gaudiness is inherently part of the charm, especially as the level is supposed to be a literal nightmare and quite literally in Vegas. It feels like a fever dream as Lara's subconscious smushes her various adventures together in the ugliest hotel known to existence. But also, Vegas isn't exactly known for its class, let's be honest. The level does seem to know it's silly though, which helps. The posters for the exhibit are playful in their design, and the warning not to climb on the sculpture after you've already climbed down on it is genuinely funny. <laughs> this is the designers having a good time and doing whatever random thing they feel like, and for that I, I respect it. The Golden Mask was a much better expansion than Unfinished Business. While the first game's expansion felt disjointed and a compilation of new levels that didn't make it into the original release, the second game feels like a unique adventure. Admittedly, it is obvious where elements have been reused from the original game, with all these supposed Russian islands feeling like Tibet all over again, with bits of offshore rig thrown in for good measure. However, these reused assets were put to use in a more imaginative way than they were in the first expansion. Plus, each level flows comfortably into the next, providing a simple story of Lara infiltrating a base, finding the secret excavation, emerging into a lost civilization, and moving through both its ruined and then still functioning parts. Each level brings something interesting to the table, and overall, it feels like a lot more than just a compilation of the base game's assets. The last artifact conceptually occupies a position similar to both the other expansions. It's a unique adventure with its own locations like the second game, but it's explicitly an epilogue to the original game, much like the first expansion. The last artifact takes place some time after the events of Tomb Raider 3. Lara learns that there was a fifth meteorite artifact, and that Dr. Willard has it locked up in his castle in Scotland. And so Lara heads up there to retrieve it, only to find someone has gotten there first. Intriguing. Let's go! Instantly we get a neat little intro that sets the tone of the expansion. We emerge outside Willard's castle with an overgrown gate that we just have to climb over to get in. This leads us out into a flooded courtyard area, and this is where I have to admit the castle setting is cool really cool. In fact, I'm pretty sure this is the only time the classic series went to a castle, which is surprising. It's the perfect Tomb Raider setting and they made good use of it here. Multiple routes, 
lots of multi-level navigation, plenty of crumbling ruins to climb on, it's exactly what you want from a Tomb Raider game. And it is a classic Tomb Raider level in its design, with the goal built around finding two thistle stones to open the exit, requiring you to head in two different directions to retrieve them. The first is a trip through the crypt, with a muddy patch you have to wade through, and a monkey swing across some graves. While the mud wading isn't entirely clear, I do like the setting with the crumbling graveyards. This area also has a fun secret involving a hidden crowbar and a timed run, which I missed the first time around, but because I had to know what was in there, I intentionally reloaded just to get it. The second area is a climb up through one of the towers. First of all, I love the presence of a meteor crater here, which implies that either the fragment landed here originally, which doesn't quite fit the story, but let's go with it, or, more likely, that Willard has been doing stuff with this fragment and caused some serious damage to his castle. There's also this brilliant little cinematic jump that's a nice touch. It's a good level and consists of mostly unique elements. I approve. Also, Nessie is here too, which makes it even better. Oh okay, this level wants to be mean. Right out of the gate, Willard's Lair is determined to murder you in increasingly creative ways. Trying to escape a boulder trap? Sorry, there are spike traps all the way down. See this basic corridor? Sliding spike traps. These rooms? Sliding spike walls. Here's a room with all the boulders. Not quite the hive, but it's close. Almost into the lair proper? Sorry, the ceilings are collapsing, should probably get that looked at. A good half hour of this level consists of you walking into rooms and being murdered, which makes it a huge relief when you finally get to the command centre because not only are the traps over, but the command centre's a pretty neat place. It's a room full of fun stuff. We get more Nessie lore, we get a map of the UK, a desk full of Willard's artifact research, and finally, most importantly, a copy of Tomb Raider 2 on every desk in the office. The most important research tool, obviously. Sadly, there's not much else to this level. This area has a bookshelf puzzle that I seemingly solved by accident, and it leads to a storage area where <gasps> the fifth artifact has been stolen. I really like this for two reasons. Number one, all this green stuff really shows off the negative effects of the artifact. But also, this is just a bit of neat little environmental storytelling that leads to the rest of the expansion existing. That's some really good stuff. This is a level set within the Channel Tunnel. I like to think of it as a counterpart to the main game's Old Witch, except where that level has Lara infiltrating an abandoned historical underground railway, one that's been out of use for decades, this level has her infiltrating the construction site of a new underground railway. So instead of seeing an approximation of the Transport for London roundel everywhere, you get to see a trademark skirting or a star logo instead. Sadly, it's not a super visually interesting level as a result. Unlike the tube with its historical stations and iconography, the channel tunnel really is just a big undersea tunnel with some rail tracks in it, which is mostly what you're seeing here along with other industrial paraphernalia. Plus, these lads in jumpsuits just trying to do their jobs and wondering why a random woman is breaking into their operations. There are a few confusing areas in this level. For instance, it's not clear when you need to shoot some vents out in certain places, this drill pit does not have an obvious route through, and the final puzzle is strange because it's not obvious what the big drill is opening. Also, while the quad bike is great, it does get a little confusing where you need to go with it once you reach a downwards pit. We do get the awesome moment of jumping a moving train though, so I'll give it that. This is probably the weakest of the expansion's levels overall though. If Fool's Gold and the Golden Mask had strong offshore rig vibes, this is that on steroids. That said, I do kind of like the structure of this level. We've got a bunch of big submersibles all strung together in the English Channel, creating a weird supervillain underwater base. It's kind of a neat idea and it opens up more possibilities than an industrial train tunnel. That said, this area took way too long to get through. I managed to find both the circuit bulbs I needed to progress, but I couldn't figure out where I had to place them, so that was kind of annoying. I did like the presence of weird mutant fish though, especially with the implications from Willard's Lair that these may be prototypes for their own super Nessies, bringing together some neat storytelling from the expansion. And speaking of weird mutants, this whole lab area is so cool for that exact same reason. Just look at these mutant designs. Like, these guys don't attack you, but it's just 
and unsettling that they're just floating there menacingly. It's a decent level all round. Plus, it ends with more of that environmental storytelling that I keep harping on about. Lara emerges from a submersible in the channel so she can head in a boat towards Paris. And also, you freed a dolphin in the process. So, everyone's a winner. First of all, the name of this level is Goofy as Heck. I know it's a Planet of the Apes reference, and I know that there's a poster for the movie, and it's all because there's monkeys, and they're annoying, and I get it, but it's still... still so goofy. <laughs> but here's the thing. I read this bit was set in Paris, but I did not expect the entire level to be set in a zoo. It's an unusual location, but it is hard not to love it. It's a visual treat, looking exactly like the kind of place I'd love to spend a weekend in, just as long as they keep the tigers in the cages. There's a lot of cool set pieces here too. The hedge maze, which managed to not be confusing to navigate, and the monkey island with no mighty pirates in sight. These are particular highlights. It's a fun little level. Definitely one of the best in all these expansions, just because of how unique a setting it is. If I do have one complaint, it's that this Joan of Arc imagery feels underused. I feel like maybe there was a secret I failed to find, which is likely, but I think a statue and some posters seem to hint at something larger that I never saw. Also, it's a bold move to end this fairly whimsical level on abject horror. Yes, please place the artifact in this chest cavity in a room full of floating bodies. It's just a really nice ending. It's just emotional whiplash, but it does lead us nicely into the next level. Uh, no! No, 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 no! Why? Oh, I see how it is, Tomb Raider 3. This is my reward for getting this far, is it? Crush me with an unexpected boulder right out of the loading screen. Bastards. Anyway, this continues the horror of the previous level's ending, and that is a good thing. The creepy heartless guys in the ethereal green pits evoke... something. I'm not sure what, but it definitely illustrates the aggressive weirdness of the artifact's magic. Also, there's a gruesome flesh pit and you have to leap of faith over it. So all of that's pretty cool. <sighs> What's less cool is what follows the promising intro. The bulk of the level is sadly a fight against Sophia Lee, the boss from the London levels of the main game, and honestly, it's just disappointing. All it has going for it is the more surreal location than the London cityscape. Otherwise, it's almost exactly the same boss. You climb the tower, you kill her from a distance at the end, and it's less interesting since instead of the puzzle solution in the main game, now you just shoot her, which is significantly more boring than what you originally had to do. For an expansion that features so much cool original content, this ending being a reused boss fight causes that excitement to just deflate. It does make up for it by making the exit inexplicably a hot air balloon, but still. Oh yeah, this is the best of the three expansions. Easily. While the first two games had expansions that drew heavily from the base game, The Lost Artifact throws a bunch of new stuff at you. Entirely new locations with original assets, all telling its own mini-adventure in the same vein as the main game. Travelling down the UK and into France is also a neat concept and drives an explicit story throughout the whole experience. It just flows really well. It also had some of the more interesting settings of all the expansions. Willard's crumbling old castle, the zoo, the flesh pit. All of these felt like the designers were just let off the leash and allowed to try whatever they felt like, and it's all the better for it. I just wish it had a better ending. That's the only thing I felt that really let the whole package down. So now, with all of my opinions expressed, here is my definitive ranking of these levels. I stand by this order, and I will not be moved on this. No arguing, my ranking 
is objectively correct at representing my subjective opinion. But for the most part, I adored these expansions. There's a playfulness to most of the levels that shows the designers were allowed to do mostly whatever they wanted. Some of the levels did a great job building on concepts from the base game, such as the Tibetan assets being rebuilt as a Soviet base in the North Pacific, or the cat statue from Tomb Raider 1's Egypt levels being given its own temple. And then you had the levels that just went nuts in the best way possible, whether that was the Furnace of the Gods and its Molten River of Gold, or a Parisian zoo that gives way to fleshy horrors. More importantly, playing these expansions for the first time cemented my love for these games. Obviously, my love of classic Tomb Raider is well documented at this point, but there obviously haven't been any official classic style games for 24 years. Playing these expansions felt like I was finally getting some new levels in this style. Obviously, none of them are actually new, but they're new to me and that's what's important here. Playing these levels for the very first time it sent me right back to when I played the main games fresh for the first time as well. It was a glorious experience. As much as I love replaying the original games, which I have also been doing with this remaster, getting something I haven't played before is glorious. This style of old school puzzling and exploration is good stuff and more modern games need to adopt it. But simply, it has been a great time finally getting to play these expansions decades late to the party. And now, I have finally played every official Tomb Raider release. No, I never mentioned any Game Boy games. You made those up. Thank you for watching, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed me expressing my opinions on the Tomb Raider expansions for the very first time. If you enjoyed it, why not give it a like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Welcome, by the way. If you'd like to support the channel, uh, you can support me on Patreon or become a member of the channel. Otherwise, just simply telling people about it is a huge help to the channel. Thank you for watching, and I will see you again very soon.